tako bomo kar začeli. Dobrodošle, dobrodošli na predzadnjem dogodku letošnjih dneva enakosti spolov na Filozofski fakulteti, na predavanju profesorice Sabine Lang z naslovom Vodenje odzadaj ali morda celo iza kulise, kako je Angela Merkel oblikovala nemško politiko enakosti spolov. Predavanje bo potekalo tako, da bo najprej predavateljica v 40 do 50 minutah predavala na napovedano temo, potem pa bo odgovorila na nekaj vprašanj. Vse skupaj pa bomo morali zaključiti ob 17.20 uri, ker ima profesorica potem takoj druge obveznosti. Dovolite mi, da najprej predstavim našo današnjo predavateljico, zelo nakratko seveda, Profesorica Sabine Lang je profesorica Evropskih in mednarodnih študij na šoli Henry M. Jackson na Univerzi v Washingtonu in predstojnica Jean Monnet katedr za civilno družbo. Vodi tudi Centar Evropske unije in program Evropskih študij na Univerzi v Washingtonu. Raziskovanje profesorice Lang je usmerjeno na presečišče držav in družb v nacionalnih in transnacionalnih okoljih s povdarkom na glaso javnosti in zagovorništvo v Evropski uniji. Ukvarja se tudi z vlogo spola v politiki s posebnim povdarkom na političnem predstavništvu žensk in zagovorništvu žensk v Evropi. Je ustanovna članica sekcije za ženske in politiko Nemškega združenja za politologijo in ustanovna urednica Femina politika, vodilne revije o ženskah in politiki v Nemško govorečih državah. Je avtorica in urednica številnih knjig z tega področja, med njimi na jomenim samo nekaj, politiše Öffentkleid, ah, ne bom, Öffentlichkeit in modern stat, I'm not sure that I pronounce it well, Civil Society and the Public Sphere, Gender Equality in Politics, Implementing Party Quotas in Germany and Austria, in skupa iz Petra Arens in Filipom Ajubom, Leading from Behind Gender Equality in Germany during the Merkel era. Njeno tokratno predavanje bo tako izhajalo prav iz te knjige in zdaj predajam kar besedo profesorici Sabine Lang, Sabine, I shortly introduced you. You know everything about you and what I have said. It was a really short introduction, and now the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Milica, and thank you all for being here. It's early in the morning here, late afternoon, your time, and I really appreciate. I see some sunshine outside that you are still sitting in your offices and uh, are interested in, in this topic. So I'm going to talk about 50 minutes. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and uh, hopefully uh, guide you through some interesting aspects of Angela Merkel's legacy as um, a very, I would say, um, influential person in this universe of uh, German gender politics. Um, you can see the screen all well and you can hear me? Great. Yes. Okay. Um, let me start um, by just pointing out that we don't know that much about Angela Merkel as an equality promoter. Um, that has inspired me, together with my co-colleagues, uh, Petra Ahrens from um, Finland and Philip Ayub, who is at the University College London, um, two collaborators that I've worked with over the years uh, on, on, on several projects that has inspired us um, in the early 2020s to really start thinking about what this legacy of what was called the most powerful woman in the world. Um, Angela Merkel was um, named uh, the Time Woman of the Year, the fourth woman ever since 1927, several times. What this legacy that Merkel stands for in terms of her overall policy impact globally, what that means for gender. Um, we assembled um, nine authors um, who helped us think through different aspects of gender policy uh, in Merkel's 
uh, four terms as chancellor. And uh, so much of the work that I'm presenting today is really based on the foundations of this, this collaboration. Um, I just want to make sure that you that you understand that. So um, Angela Merkel um, survived um, four US presidents, um, five um, British presidents, four French presidents. Um, she has shown over those years a clear commitment to um, Europeanization uh, with, of course, a lot of conflicts involved. She's shown a clear commitment to um, economic and financial transformations in the European Union. She has steered Europe through major crises, sometimes with a very unique approach, um, i.e. the migration crisis, where she pretty much single-handedly um, abandoned Schengen and Dublin and opened up uh, Germany for uh, refugees. Um, so um, she, in many ways, appears to be a doer, appears to be somebody who is taking the lead in policies. But our argument is that she is not so much a leader in the traditional sense in gender policies, but that she does what the book is called, uh, a special issue in German politics was called, she does lead from behind. Before I um, let you know a little bit more about what this means, I'd like to just um, give a few, um, why is, are we not going? We are not going forward here. Uh, um, now we are. I'd like to give you just a few items of background uh, on Angela Merkel. What you see here is uh, her in 1991, when she was sworn in for her first position as actually women's minister, a family women um, senior and youth minister in the first coal cabinet, um, in, 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 in the uh, third coal cabinet, excuse me. Um, she is by training a physicist, um, was actually born not in West Germany. She was born in Hamburg and uh, not in East Germany. She was born in Hamburg in West Germany and moved with her family. Her dad was a Protestant minister, moved to East Germany when she was a little kid. Um, wasn't very involved in politics um, until the Wende, uh, when she joined uh, a movement called Democratic Awakening, which was more of a centrist um, conservative movement, not um, uh, one of the more left uh, socialist uh, movement groups that emerged during the Wende. And um, when she was asked to uh, become secondary spokesperson for uh, the uh, former and, and last um, prime minister of the GDR. She uh, was uh, interested, flattered, did a good job, and thus got on the radar of the West German CDU. Um, after um, the unification in 1990, um, she had a quick ascent because she was really under the auspices of Helmut Kohl, this, this um, chancellor of the Wende, conservative politician who adopted her and um, that got her the early and not so flattering nickname of Kohl's girl, Kohl's Mädchen, uh, which she was semi-happy about. She was very clear that without some assistance. She wouldn't have ascended that early into politics, but she was also somebody who had her very own ideas about um, how to restructure the CDU, and that should ultimately then um, lead to her uh, taking over the party. So from 1991, in the family women's ministry, she moved on quickly to the environmental ministry, um, became um, party general secretary in 98. And then when um, 
Chancellor Cole uh, was involved in a internal fundraising affair, um, she um, became chancellor candidate. Um, this notion that she was first the girl of the chancellor and then the mother of the nation already shows that to some degree her uh, ascent had this very gendered um, aspect to it, um, you know, we would not call um, a, a, a male politician under normal circumstances a father of X Y Z. She became the mother of the German Republic and the German public, and she was seen um, by her biographers as somebody who did not play on her gender, in fact, did a lot of things in her appearance to degender herself. And at the same time, the media and the public always associated with her a very closely knit, uh, what they call then the girls camp, her assistants, her immediate advisor, all women uh, who uh, really showed um, ascendancy to public office in a broader scale with her with her chancellorship. Um, I just said she was probably seen as most effective in international politics, but I want to show you something about her effectiveness domestically in gender policies. One more aspect before we get there, um, I just want to give you a few um, items of background where Germany was in terms of uh, gender equality in uh, uh, in the aftermath of the unification and then her ascendancy to power. Uh, you probably all know West Germany, historically a very conservative, very male breadwinner oriented society. So um, until 1977, for example, uh, women uh, could only hold a job if, uh, and this was a law, if it was in line with her duties as um, a caretaker of children and as a wife. Um, there was a stark dependency on male breadwinners. Uh, when women entered uh, the labor force, they did so mostly half time because there was no other option um, of uh, getting childcare. Schools ended um, up until the late 1980s at midday. So afterwards without childcare, um, no way for really an aspiring um, career woman to make that work without financial means. Um, so a, 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 a situation in which a, a women's movement, movement had arisen that um, in its early iteration did not want to engage with the state and state policies very much. And then in the 1980s, slowly came around and um, and advocated for state-sponsored policies, for equality, for affirmative action, for child care, and so on. But in 1989, with the wall falling, had not gotten that far with it. On the other side of the wall, in East Germany, a very different model, a model that uh, we tend to call a socialist emancipatory uh, notion uh, that also did not lead to equality in a broader sense, but allowed women to uh, be on equal footing in terms of education, uh, comprehensive child care, uh, comprehensive support for combining care and family, um, a lot of overload for women in that system as well. But in short, two very, very different systems of gender aspirations collided in 1989. And the way to combine those in 1990 um, was, was, um, uh, was really producing two very separate narratives. One was the narrative of the West taking over, which um, indeed to some degree is a legitimate narrative because unification happened by the GDR dissolving and coming under the administrative and legal 
uh, purview of West Germany. So it was not a negotiation about a new constitution. Um, the other notion, and that is what I've been working on for some time in the past decade, is to also understand how strongly this East German legacy has impacted post-unification gender policies. Um, I argue that uh, in terms of constitutional equality, affirmative action, focus on care in the post-1990s era, uh, West Germany wouldn't have moved as far and as quickly without the strong impact of East Germany. And so when we have Angela Merkel um, ascending uh, in the 1990s, um, we do have a situation in which this push um, of unification has already produced some tangible result. So for example, in 1996, there is the first federal law that guarantees half day of childcare for children three days and older. Uh, rape, marital rape is criminalized in 1997. Um, the huge discrepancy between employment in East Germany, former East Germany then, and West Germany is of big consideration because um, a lot of women of the former East Germany uh, face unemployment in the 1990s. So um, there is a strong push to uh, surround employment opportunities with full-time schooling until uh, mid-afternoon as well as care and other items that will signal to women that uh, this unified Germany is um, not just as infamously um, social democratic chancellor Schröder called it in the 1990s, the women's gedöns, the women's fuss, the fuss they're making about gender politics. So something is moving forward in the 1990s, but nothing compared to the then unprecedented scale of what we see in terms of a push for gender equality when Merkel takes office and in her four successive um, periods of, um, of chancellery. Um, of course, I won't be able to talk about all of these Laws. Um, I also want to point out what that what you're seeing here. This is actually a chart from our book. What you're seeing here indicates these two different coalition models in which Merkel operated. So three out of these four periods, you see that on the first um, X line. Three of those four periods were a coalition. Um, uh, I'm sorry, two of those four periods were coalitions between, sorry, I'm confusing things here. Three were grand coalitions with the uh, SPD, with the Social Democrats, and one was a coalition with her liberal partner, the FDP. So for the most of those 16 years in tenure for 12 years, uh, Merkel has to engage productively with social democratic colleagues. And I do want to make an argument that that plays a major role in why we're seeing massive investment into gender politics, not because she does not indirectly support these legislations, but because she's being pushed by her social democratic grand coalition partners, and she is very efficient in leading from behind. Back to our book. So um, I'm going to make an argument in four chapters in the next few minutes. I want to talk a little bit about how women's representation developed in her four chancellery periods, how labor market innovation took place, uh, what she did about care policies, and what she did about LGBTQI policies. One more quick remark. Um, the book showcases 
theoretical anchors in a few literatures that you might or maybe might not be so much familiar with. Um, this notion of women as leaders um, has been with us for quite some time here in the sense that we have, um, I think by now, pretty substantial empirical evidence for uh, a, a, a particular mode of leadership that comes out of women's experiences as often juggling politics, their occupation, family um, needs from different stakeholders that lead women uh, to work uh, for the most part and always with exceptions, but as a tendency, lead women to work more cooperatively, to work more team oriented, to employ stronger horizontal um, communication and to um, assess the discursive context and discursive claims making in their respective environment, uh, maybe with a little bit more aplomb, being more attuned to those voices. Um, that does not mean that we see women leaders necessarily as feminists. Um, there is plenty of evidence that um, you can be an effective women leader uh, without a strong commitment to feminism. And we have increasingly also a strong literature, my colleagues Sarah Childs, uh, Rosie Campbell and others um, in the UK are, are kind of leading that debate that showcases that conservative women leaders can be quite effective in advocating for particular gender policies. So the question where Merkel fits in here is um, complicated and um, is actually anchoring this study of ours because you could say that Merkel is fitting very well in this women leadership model as being um, seen as anti ideological, very oriented towards pragmatic. And uh, since she's a physicist trained in evidence proven, evidence driven policy making, um, she is a good listener. Um, she does scan the discursive context of claims making around her very well. Um, and she proved to be able to change course if um, the conditions changed. Um, her uh, turn on nuclear energy in Fukushima is one example for that. So she fits very well in the model of a women conservative leader who is able to make pragmatic choices. She um, is not really calling herself a feminist in her early um Sorry about that, need to go back in her early um, tenure, um, but she leads from behind. She does what we have dissected in our book, uh, lead from behind in different ways. Um, she sometimes actively facilitates a discussion in gender policies. She introduces a topic and then sees how the chips fall, how the discursive claims making take place. Sometimes she very passively and very indirectly facilitated policies by letting others take the lead. Um, um, famously, her um, family minister in early years, Ursula von der Leyen, who is now president of the European Commission, took the lead on several policies and Merkel did not utter a thing about those, um, saw how Ursula von der Leyen did in the cabinet and in the broader public discussion, and then at some point stepped in if she felt a decision had been produced. So um, she actively, she passively facilitates, and sometimes we also see that she evolves in her facilitation by coming from a very passive stance 
to a more active involvement. But um, what we can definitely stipulate and say that she has not taken the lead like Margaret Thatcher has taken the lead on policies like uh, half like 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 um, being a very strong and um, engaged and frontline um, personality. I just said Merkel did not call herself a feminist. Um, we call her and uh, some other colleagues, uh, my my colleague Joyce Mooshaben, who's written a great book about Merkel um, called uh, Becoming Madam Chancellor, did so. Uh, we call her a reluctant feminist because in the early years and actually up until 2020, uh, Merkel did not commit to um, a feminist notion of politics. Uh, what you see here is a meeting in which she um, discussed with Christine Lagarde, then head of the World Bank, and Ivanka Trump uh, notions of women and politics. And um, she said at the time, um, I don't want to claim to be a feminist. There are others who work more actively in movement related um, aspects, and I don't support all of what they're standing for. This changes in uh, 2021, when for the first time, really, we hear her utter the word. Um, I can now say that I am a feminist, um, if this means standing for equality between genders and doing everything to promote notions of equality, then this is where I can uh, out myself as, as a feminist. But it took her a long time. So let me show you in these four chapters why we articulate this notion of leading from behind. So I want to start with descriptive representation. Um, this is uh, work that I do uh, with Petra Ahrens, but also with Birgit Sauer on quota policies in Europe. And Petra and I have researched quota policies in uh, the German parliament with an eye on the conservative party, Merkel's party, and how that developed. Um, Germany is not doing great on women's representation in parliament. It's in the middle of uh, European participation in national parliaments of women. You see two big jumps here. Um, the first one is uh, in 1983, uh, you see women's representation going from 9.8 to 15.4%. And that is a jump that actually is induced by the Green Party entering parliament with a very strict quota of, 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 of putting 50% women into parliamentary seats. And then you see a second jump in the early 1990s. We attribute this jump to uh, unification and more Eastern German women entering the German parliament. But overall, uh, Merkel enters office in 2005. You see a stable but not very strong increase in descriptive representation of uh, women. In terms of quotas, um, Germany does not have a legislative quota for women in politics. We have only voluntary party quotas. And so it's really important to look at what particular parties do in terms of representation and reaching their quotas. Um, we have developed something sounds a little maybe too scientific, um, a, a uh, post quota gender gap index. And what that means is that we're looking at when parties establish quotas um, and we look at how well they fulfill them. And what you see here is the four parties in Germany that have quotas, uh, the Conservative Party on the upper left, uh, Christian Democratic Union, the Social Democratic Party, Chancellor Scholz's party now on the right, then the Green Party and the Left Party. 
And the lines, of course, the 50% line is clear. That is what we would want for parity. And the lower line there is the party's respective establishment of a quota, or in the case of the conservative party, they called it a quorum. They didn't want to call it a quota. They didn't like quota, so they called it a quorum. And then we calculate um, gender representation in parliament and check out, and these are the um the, the the lines that you see in lighter color the um the lines that will add up to for each party to reach their respective quota and you see here that while the greens and the left party for the most part fulfill their quota the conservatives are notoriously bad at that and under Merkel, 2005, again, um, up to 2021, we see that not really a lot has happened in the Christian Democratic Union. If we zoom in on their respective, you probably can't see the, 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 the right screen there. But um, if we zoom in, we see that their post quota gender gap is massive. And so the quorum is not happening, is not getting enforced. And Merkel does very little to advise women, to encourage women, to move women into electable positions in the German system. Um, it's not as though there aren't adequate numbers of candidates in the Christian Democratic Unions. It is the selection process then in which uh, districts these women are being run as candidates that makes them ultimately not succeed in becoming elected. Um, Merkel's um, take on the situation is for three of the four elected periods, um, Quotas are not the right way to address it. Let's um, have more education. Let's have more promotional campaigns to get women into office. Um, and it is not until her good friend and former defense minister, and then in her fourth period of chancellery, uh, she, be she became party um, general secretary and, 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 and uh, Merkel's really uh, relying on her. It is not until this woman, um, her name is Annegret kamp karen -Power, we call her AKK in shorthand, is coming in and saying this is not working. We need to stand for something else and do something else. And again, Merkel does not endorse what AKK mm -hmm. puts out publicly, but AKK says, I'm a quota woman. Many women in the Conservative Party are quota women. And therefore, she comes in uh, two years ago and demands uh, for the next party Congress, we need to establish a 50% and uh, a strict quota for women in the Conservative Party. Um, you, Merkel does not say a single word about this. Um, she is, she says, this is a party decision. Um, I'm outgoing, so I will not get involved in this. But of course, we know that this would not have happened without Merkel's blessing. And so the outcomes, um, Merkel steps down in 2021 and uh, COVID hits. There is no party Congress. So the latest party Congress that has now um, taken place under new leadership of um, uh, Friedrich Merz. Um, this new uh, leader, who is also a quota skeptic, realizes that he needs to showcase something to women in the conservative sway. And so there is now a compromise, which I would call a quota light. Um, there is a notion that the conservatives will aim for 50% in party offices by 2025. There is uh, uh, for list and direct candidates in elections, a packages solution that of every three candidates, 
one needs to be a woman, um, but there are also a lot of loopholes. So um, if you cannot find a woman as candidate, um, you can, in the second round of uh, elections, vote for men. Uh, and the whole package, as it was being um, put into the party um, um, uh, stipulations, is based on not a must provision, but a should provision. And we all know what that means. Um, if it's not obligatory, we can anticipate that there will be a lot of ways to um, circumvent this. Okay, Merkel has indirectly facilitated from behind here. Let's look at a second set of um, provisions related to labor market. Um, again, I could talk about all of these policies and I won't um, in lieu of time. So let me quickly address the corporate board, board quota policies that happened under Merkel. Initially, she is opposed to corporate board quotas. Um, in fact, when uh, this is being launched on the European level, um, Merkel subtly but very effectively uh, nicks this quota and says Germany will not participate in it. Um, on the national level, she opts for voluntary um, quotas on um, executive boards and uh, in leadership positions, that does not bring any results. Uh, the Social Democrats get very antsy about this because that is one of their general provisions that they have stipulated in their party program. So um, in 2015, ultimately, it's being decided that there should be a corporate board quota. It's being uh, negotiated and established in 16 quite successfully. Uh, what we see now in terms of uh, women's participation in corporate executive boards um, is quite a change to what we've had before. Um, again, no word from Merkel for long periods. She is adamantly stepping back and letting the social democratic coalition partner um, take the lead. Um, she is very adamant that this is considered to be an experiment, that it is considered to be something that we just need to evaluate more specifically. But ultimately, she lets the SPD women's ministry take the lead and the results, sorry, that's in German here. So you see on the left, the overall results of 33.5% women on uh, German big uh, enterprises boards in 2022. And what, and on the right and the light green, those are the companies with quotas. What is really interesting is the yellow one in the middle because it shows you that the uh, surrogate effect of having quotas being a necessary item in a certain number of publicly traded and, and, and large companies also means that firms that do not need to require a quota also step in line and see the um, writing on the wall that it's better for them to get more women into their board. So this is again a policy where we see um, massive investment, but it is led by the Social Democratic Partner with the consent of Merkel, but not with her active endorsement. Third policy I quickly want to address is care policies. Um, here we have um, Merkel, as opposed to these other two examples, actually having a strong interest because this is part of her DNA from her GDR times to really think that the options for women need to be increased to increase labor market participation. And she sees it and articulates it clearly as a social investment issue. 
There's also, also in this case, strong pressure from the EU with the Barcelona targets from, tw from 2003, actually, that stipulated that 90% um, of uh, children age three and up should have a place in a childcare facility and 33% uh, of children under three should have that opportunity. Germany is very, very far from this. I can, I can show you quickly. So this is here what it's looking like when Merkel comes into office um, in West Germany. Um, there are, um, you know, 7% of children under three who have a place in a childcare. Um, and it is really with, again, the endorsement of the Social Democrats and the EU pressure in this case from the outside that then we reach a number that is um, re reaching 86%, you can't see it here right now, um, in uh, 2021 of childcare, three years and up, and 31% here in 2021 of zero to two years. So again, a policy where I would say Merkel has had some um, pressure from the EU. Um, she sees this as a clear labor market issue and a care issue that's tied into social investment policy for society at large. And um, she articulates her commitment to care more strongly than her commitment to quotas, um, not as a gender equality issue, but as a social equity issue and a labor market issue. Last policy, and I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'll, I'll make this short. Um, the LGBTQ policies that she also pushes from behind indirectly facilitating a new consensus that stretches the ideological commitment of her party quite tremendously, but she is um, allowing people to make up her own mind. She articulates that she is not a proponent of the Marriage Equality Act, that she respects everybody's vote. She also says that she will vote against it um, to be in line with her party majority. We don't know, but she abandons, and this is um, you know, one of her savvy um, behind the scenes acts. Uh, she abandons party discipline. So the caucus discipline, even in her own party, she she um, tells uh, her uh, conservative colleagues that they would could vote their conscience. And therefore we get to a marriage equality act that under different circumstances in her conservative party would not have been possible. Again, domestic pressures from the Social Democrats, from other left parties, and international pressure, pressures from uh, movements from ILGA in Europe and from the EU level are central. Um, but she finds a way to uh, domesticate what could have become a strong conflict by way of a um, administrative move or 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 a, 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 a bureaucratic move that allows everybody to vote the way they um, want to and uh, therefore comes to a progressive policy. So let me close with a few thoughts on what uh, my co-authors uh, Philip and and Petra and I see as the effects of leading from behind. Um, Merkel did in fact pave the way for more women in public office, first by showcasing in her own direct environment that she was pushing women. Um, uh, in all of her cabinets, the number of women um, were increased compared to previous cabinets. Um, she 
did a good job in highlighting competencies of women in her particular cabinet portfolio. Um, and she, over time, came to articulate policies that are social conservative in, in, in their feminist orientation. So take into account um, social investment on labor market, take into account combining care and family, but not really a strong proponent of active equality policy that in our understanding would require more radical change in the term and fabric of politics and, and society. Um, the downside of this more cautious leading from behind now is that uh, the pendulum swings back in our assessment. So with Merkel gone, um, her uh, successor as party leader, uh, Friedrich Merz, um, is seeing the need for getting more women wo votes out for the conservatives. But in most substantive policy directions, um, we don't see that much investment in um, gender equality. Um, if Merkel would have tapped more into a stronger public imagery that would articulate women's central role in, in society and politics and the economy, maybe that pendulum could not have swung that much back for the Conservative Party. So um, while we see her successes, we also want to articulate that those successes are driven by factors that are external to Merkel's um, active involvement and, and therefore uh, lack a little bit the, the strong sense of pushing for women that um, she could have done over her four periods in, in office. So did Merkel pave the way for more women in politics? Uh, you see here the 2021 election results um, with uh, um, the effect that we now have a social democratic chancellor um, in a coalition with um, the liberals and the Green Party. Um, Women and men voted on equal footing for the conservatives, but you see that the other voter parties, social democrats and greens in particular, have a stronger hold on women and the women's vote here. Um, did Merkel pave the way for what we now see with a green foreign minister and a strong articulation of a feminist foreign policy? Did Merkel pave the way for uh, a feminist German policy reorientation? Um, we don't think so. Um, the first indicator that things are not going so well, um, we see now um, there was a, a strong effort to have electoral reform. Um, in order to um, downsize the number of parliamentary seats. But attached to that was also, uh, over the last few years, a strong demand to introduce a legislative quota in politics, as France has, for example, other countries have. Um, this did not happen. Um, there is um, um, an electoral reform commission suggesting all kinds of revisions that have uh, nothing to do with getting more women, women's equality and parity into public office. Um, and even though we have now a strong green footprint in German politics, um, particularly in foreign policy, um, a lot of people feel that some of Merkel's legacy is kind of um, lost to produce a stronger engagement with um, a radical change in uh, overall women's policy. And I'm happy to discuss more examples of that with you. Um, thank you for listening. And um, I'm happy to answer some questions if you'd like. Of course, first of all, thank you, Sabine, for this um, interesting and thought-provoking lectures on how even conservative women can be 
active supporter uh, of gender equality issues. Um, I think that uh, Angela Merkel is a great woman politician that, uh, as you've said, uh, and showed uh, did a lot uh, in this respect, but of course she was uh, pushed in a sandwich, if I may say so, from abroad and from, um, uh, let's say, left wing uh, and and feminist movements uh, inside Germany. Uh, this this practice it was also very effective in Slovenia, I must say. Uh, in, in the context of how we uh, were getting uh, legislative gender quotas in our uh, uh, law, uh, it was the same case as uh, in, in some uh, cases in, in Germany. Uh, there were pressures from European Union when we were in the phase of accepting Slovenia in the European family and also the demands from uh, organized women's organizations uh, and feminist uh, activists uh, in the civil society. And uh, those two factors, I think, that uh, brought uh, Slovenia to the, to, the, to the point in which uh, they decided to, to vote. Of course, there were also support from some um, 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 academics and large support from uh, political actors from both sides, from, from left, and, uh, left and right uh, political parties, but uh, um, without this pressure from outside and from, uh, from uh, uh, above, I think that uh, it would not be possible in Slovenia as well. Uh, now I won't uh, talk too much, but I would like to uh, give the floor to your questions and comments. So please take a floor. If nobody wants to ask, then I would like to ask a, a question on language. Uh, you uh, began your lecture by, uh, by um, actually, uh, Naming some of of um, of the descriptions that were pointed appointed to uh, Miss Mer Merkel, uh, like Polsmädchen uh, or Mutti and so etc. So, um, are there any other, for example, uh, names that she was um, given, or um, any metaphors, any language uh, um, interesting or language related? Uh, um, um, issues that you would like to point out. And uh, second, my second question is, if in the, I meant, I, for example, in the last uh, years, I see that, for example, the language use, so um, this uh, gen gender equality uh, language use is uh, becoming also a political question. So more and more parties in Germany, for example, say, yes, we are for the use of uh, gender uh, sensitive uh, language and others tend to say, no, we are against that. So if uh, if you also spotted some, some doing of Miss Merkel on this field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am I responding directly yeah. or do Yeah, I think so. Yeah, great. Is, uh, great. Um, so other ways in which she was uh, named or, or seen, um, I associate uh, some of these things less with language than I associate them with symbolic representation. Um, you know, so she is being seen as emblematic of this calm personality by always doing the diamond, the outer. That was something that uh, she she that will stick with her, I think, for her life for a lifetime. She is being seen as somebody who um, is 
very thoroughly trying to degender her appearance in public. So she is the suit woman, um, always a placer, always a black pants. Um, there is one incident early in her uh, first chancellorship where she attends uh, the, the Wagner Festival in Bayreuth uh, with a dress and a cleavage that is just flooring the German media for reasons that might only have to do with a gendering of her body that nobody had um, associated with her, right? And she learns very quickly to just abandon every notion of gender symbolically and appear as the neutral um, leader. Um, Yes, um, there, 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 there are many, many ways in which um, the struggle over language um, has entered um, German um, media politics. Um, in I, I don't know if you follow this, but in the major German media uh, channels, um, there is right now actually a big debate if uh, the um, media programs, the political programs in particular, the Tagesschau show and so on, should articulate a gender star or a um, a, a non-gendered language. Um, Merkel has been very careful with that. She has uh, often articulated the female and the male pronouns when she is in public and talks to her audiences. Um, but again, she's not making an ideological statement out of this. You, you would never let her, you, you would never see her articulate this as a political statement, it's more of a subdued but indirect message that she sees women as well as men. Um, she could have done more on that front as well, um, but we could also articulate within the context of this historically very conservative party, she did more than uh, her predecessors did. Thank you. Okay, one question in the, um, yeah, two questions in the chat. In Slovenia, there are women, women in the leading positions with the political field. However, they tend to be very reluctant and resistant to identify with or to be identified as feminists. How would you comment on that? And how could feminism is a bad word mentally Mental and mentality be ad mentality be addressed. I wanted to ask very similar question. So, can you comment on uh, or can you say some more about uh, the um, reaction of feminist activists and media after she and uh, uh, after uh, Merkel announced that she is a feminist? Because we we've, we've been. <laughs> um, We've seen what happened in Slovenia in the last half half of a year, when several um, um, women politicians first said, "I'm not a feminist," and then after a couple of months, they said, "Oh, maybe I am feminist if feminism means this and that," but never really clearly uh, said um, what should be said about feminism. So, I think. Um, Maybe there are some similarities between uh, German politicians and Angela, Angela Merkel and and uh, and what what's happened in Slovenia. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah, could well be. Um, so when she announced this, um, different reactions um, by German feminist actors. Um, a clear high sign and you know almost a, a a sense of relief okay so finally she 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 articulates something that her policies have shown in part but she stands for something now that she actually could have spent you know a lot more time with in, in the past decade advocating for and and being part of um 
the the mainstream media have commentary on her um, feminist turn by women writers who pick up on this, but it's not becoming a major political topic in you know across the board. And interestingly, even within her party, it seemed as though she had um, she she was untouchable by that point. You know, she was she had four periods as chancellor. She stepped out down out of her own volition, not forced. She could have uh, put her head in for a fifth term. She didn't. So I think her legacy within the own within her own party kind of gave her a a uh, plot set to articulate um, feminism in a different way than when she was still trying to hold this party together. Um, we did not observe any, you know, bashing or any 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 strong criticism her, of her um, in 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 that regard. Is feminism still a bad word in politics, at, at least in Germany, or, or it's not? It is a polarized term in the sense that you have a rising well, or now stable at 12 to 15 percent alt-right party. You have the the, the alternative for Germany um, in parliament uh, and in higher numbers in some state parliaments. That is a party that really brings anti-feminism into the fray in a, in a very um, pronounced and, and, and ideological mode. Mm -hmm. um, and the argument, I think, would be that with this alt-right 15% of a voter base that, you know, is anti-quota, anti-feminist, um, anti-language policy, and so on and so on, and puts feminism really at the core of their ideological fray. With that being in place, the Conservative Party was able over the past years to move more into the center and articulate a feminist conservative agenda too, as well. And so I would say no for probably 70% of the German party spectrum and population, it's not a bad word, but then you have a gray zone and then you have 15% of an alt-right that redefines um, feminism in a in a in a very aggressive way and um changes parliamentary culture too you know we we just had a survey um among parliamentary representatives last year um that showcases how women parliamentarians feel attacked uh, belittled uh, laughed at um their topics being sidelined so I think there is a culture, I wouldn't call it war, but a culture challenge um, in, in, in the German public and in parliament, it, it's epitomized by, mm -hmm. by the AfD. Mm -hmm. One more question from the chat. Um, can we in the near future expect new Merkel, Merkel in the European era? <laughs> oh boy, where would you, are you thinking the new Merkel in Germany or are we looking for the new Merkel across the European leaders? Um, you know, Ursula von der Leyen is an interesting personality and um, for some years people thought that she was the natural successor to Merkel in German politics. Um, she comes out of a political family. Her dad was governor of an important northern state. Um, she raised seven children, is a medical doctor, and is now doing uh, European Union Commission politics. So very active, uh, prolific, engaged personality. But domestically, um, 
she was in part was what Merkel was not. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen domestically stepped on many men's toes um, as um, family minister, then as defense minister in her party role. So what we thought for quite some time that she was the natural successor does not seem to be an option right now. Um, too controversial to articulate, not leading from behind, but leading very strongly up front. Um, I think her, what some saw as her escape to Brussels um, works really well for her. There she projects this kind of strong leadership. Um, if she can come back from Brussels is an open question. I doubt it. I don't think so, actually. So in the absence of Ursula von der Leyen, um, the other woman I just showed you as a, as a successor, potentially heir to Angela Merkel, AKK, Annegret kram um, she stepped down as party leader because she did not have the support of um, the, 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 the male um, cadre of potential successors to Merkel. Um, and that was a long and winding answer to saying, no, I do not see in the Christian Democratic Party a successor to Merkel anytime soon, really. What about in the uh, larger Europe? Do you see any politician that can be, can replace the role of, uh, and can, you know, proceed the role of Angela Merkel? Um, not immediately. Um, what I think we see is an amazing uh, development of younger women stepping into office. Um, and um, that I find exciting because that, that also means that a younger generation feminism is entering in many, um, in many countries. We, we also see, um, you know, Sana Marin um, losing the election in Finland. Um, on an international level, uh, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand saying, um, I don't have it in me. I don't have it in my tank anymore to continue. So we see women being more realistic about their uh, commitment to this kind of job. Um, Merkel gave it all, uh, had, um, had the backing of her partner, but, you know, no, 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 no immediate family to take care of. Um, and so this younger generation of women that's now stepping into European politics um, will need to figure this out and will hopefully need to change the political climate of, of what it means to be a leader in this European fray. Um, I'm counting on this at least to be successful to some degree, because you know the Ursula von der Leyen's are rare, and um, there should be with more younger women in politics really a stronger reflection about what it means to do this job. So, would we want another Ursula von der Leyen and Angela Merkel on with this intensity of commitment? We would, we would, I think, want to reflect on different parameters to this job that makes it workable for more women. I, I will go a little bit forward in this question. Is there in SPD any younger woman who can, you know? Uh, go for the role of uh, a kind of politician that could be uh, compared with uh, um, with Finland new feminism in politics, uh, despite the fact that they were not successful in the last election, but they they made a great progress in 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 um, showing how politics can be different if there are women in the politics. Do you, do you see in SPD any chances of the woman leaders that can, you know, 
go forward? Well, um, that's really a puzzle in German politics, or maybe it's not a puzzle because um, the social democratic history is one um, that advocated gender policies quite strongly, but then also kept women at the top in check. Um, what I mean by that is um, that historically, um, the more labor oriented and um, kind of economically oriented men politicians, Gerhard Schröder, Sigmar Gabriel, um, now uh, Scholz, um, take leadership positions quite easily over uh, women. There are a few women in governor's positions on the state level that had the potential to move up. Um, there is in particular uh, a woman named Manuela Schwesig. She's governor of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, uh, one of the northeastern states, um, or the, the most northeastern state in Germany. Um, she had um, aspirations. Um, I think she had the potential. Um, then um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine came and the energy situation that needed to be um, addressed across Europe. And Manuela Schwesig uh, stands or stood for policies towards Russia that were very cooperative. Um, the North Stream 2 pipeline, this new pipeline um, that um, was going to bring more gas into uh, the West via Germany, that is a project in Manuela Schwesig state. Um, when um, when um, the um, sanctions hit uh, that Europe uh, established against Russia and against firms that would work with Russia um, in under under Schwesig's auspices, a foundation was funded in MacPom in, in the state to complete the pipeline. So this had a very bad uh, public image uh, result for her. Um, I'm not sure she can ever recover from that. Um, I think uh, with with um, aligning herself too much with um, the, the the Russian cooperation, um, she has really forfeited chances in the near future to rise. Um, there's another governor. Um, unfortunately, she has health issues, um, so she won't come up. Um, I don't see anybody at this point in the Social Democrats to step up. It's a pity. <laughs> Because the party is yeah, it's, it's strong and uh, can you know uh, make some changes in the in some parts of politics that are important for women. Anyway, um, maybe my last questions would be uh, on gender quotas. As you know, we we have gen legislative gender quotas in Slovenia, and they really brought changes um, in descriptive, of course, way. Uh, why why this was not possible to make it in 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 germany um, is this connected to the as it was uh, in our case to the socialist past or to something that is not bearable for uh, uh, politics in germany because it's a kind of um, obligatory this uh, that it, 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 it's kind of a pressure that it's not needed or what is what was the reason not being successful in uh, accepting legislative gender quotas in parliament so there's several arguments that are in the public discussion um the, the the most direct confrontation with uh, establishing a legislative quota is always cited to be the German party system because we vote uh, with two votes. Um, our first vote goes towards the local district and our second vote goes towards the overall percentage that the party will have in a in a in a legislature. And 
parties historically, especially con the conservative party, um, do not want to give up this district related vote. Um, historically, the conservatives get many more of those direct candidacy votes than uh, than other parties do. And um, of course, then the feminist advocates of legislative quotas are, are saying, okay, then let's keep the district vote, but let's make the districts larger and have two votes in every district. So one vote for a woman, one vote for a man. Um, this is at this point not a discussion that is taken up by the institutions on any level. What I hear, uh, we've, we've done interviews with parliamentarians on that, what I hear is mostly, wow, then this district will be so big and I cannot potentially serve it anymore. Um, um, I, I, my, the, the underlying argument is it has to do with the fact that the Conservative Party gets a lot of their votes that way and their parliamentary seats that way. So the voting system is one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that it's being deemed unconstitutional and constitutionally not possible because we have a provision in the constitution that declares party autonomy in fielding candidates and so on and so on. And uh, we've now had two cases on the state level in Thuringia, in an Eastern, former Eastern state and in um, Brandenburg where the state level constitutional courts have um, 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 eliminated an, an initiative by respective governments to es establish legislative quotas, at least on the state level, um, on the subnational level. In both these uh, court cases, the argument of party independence was was put centrally. Uh, and um, I don't think we've seen the last of it. Um, at this point, there are feminist legal initiatives to craft constitutionally sound um, legislative quota policies. Um, I think in, in 12 states, there are initiatives on the left to refurbish a, a, a legislative quota subnationally. So um, it's going to take time, but we are a laggard, not just historically in gender, we're a laggard in changes to the political system and and more innovative policies uh, on that level more broadly and so this is why we're not having a legislative quota at this point thank you uh, sabina thank you so much uh, for your lecture and also for your uh, uh, for the debate in which we uh, in which you gave us uh, an insight uh, into the german politics and what we can expect in the near future so thank you so much and uh, um, good wishes for all your um, future research and we will follow what will um, uh, near future brings to feminist and, and uh, uh, gender equality in Germany and also in Europe. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much for having me and have a good rest of your day. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Hvala vsem, ki ste prišli na predavanje in sprendali. Hvala lepa.